Well, thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Hussein Abish. I'd like to welcome you to another AGSIW uh, roundtable that we're having today. Our subject is back to sanctions. How will Iran balance regional ambitions with domestic stability? And we'll be considering uh, the issue from several different points of view. Let me begin by welcoming all of you uh, and those who are joining us online as well. Thank you very much. And ask those of you in the room to join me in putting your phones and pagers and noise-making devices on vibrate, please, right? Or turning them off. That would be fine, too. Um, now, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're, uh, we have this very distinguished panel that I'll be introducing in a second, and we will have a, a conversation uh, for about 45 minutes uh, to 50 minutes or so among ourselves about different aspects of, of these questions, and then we will bring you in and the audience for uh, questions or brief comments. And when we do that, if you could identify yourself as well as uh, posing your uh, question or brief comment. And uh, it would help if you said which of the panelists you would like uh, to address the question unless it's for everybody, which is okay too. Uh, so let me begin by introducing our uh, esteemed panel today. We're joined uh, by an uh, old uh, friend, Ambassador Sayed Hossein Mosavian, who is a Middle East specialist and nuclear policy specialist at uh, Princeton University's Program on Science and Global Security and is a very distinguished uh, Iranian uh, diplomat and official, former member of the National Security Council, spoke spokesman for the Iranian delegation during the uh, nuclear negotiations, ambassador to Germany, and what have you. Also a prolific author. He just had a very interesting piece in Al Jazeera. So thank you very much for joining us. Always a pleasure. Uh, and to my immediate left is Basma Momani, who is a senior fellow at the Center for International Governance and Innovation in Ontario and is professor at the Basili School of International Affairs at the University of Waterloo and is also uh, has numerous publications and you can read the, the full bio um, in your little handout. And finally, at the end of the table, Ali Alfone, uh, who has recently joined us here at AGSIW as a senior fellow and who is the author of Iran Unveiled, How the Revolutionary Guards Transforming Iran from Theocracy into Military dictatorship and many other publications and uh, really pleased and delighted to have him as a colleague here. Um, so let's begin by acknowledging that nothing's going on. Right? There's no news today or anything like that. Uh, nothing's happening uh, either internationally or domestically. Uh, but uh, with that sort of um, iron irony aside, there, there's been quite a lot of movement on Iran's diplomatic position. Uh, in the global conversation in the past 24 to 48 hours, right? Uh, important speech at the UN, a uh, series of important speeches at the UN. And today, President Trump uh, went and um, graced the Security Council with his presence and called on the world to come together to deny Iran a nuclear weapon, which it says it isn't trying to get and doesn't want. Uh, and, of course, Iran was not present because it is not a member of the Security Council, but uh, Iranian leaders have had some uh, choice words for him, uh, both from the General Assembly podium and uh, in other forums. Uh, in addition to which, uh, it's, it's worth noting that um, Europeans are continuing to uh, develop their own um, project for making the JCPOA uh, continue to function, the special purpose vehicle that they're working on to transfer payments to Iran, uh, indicates a, uh, a degree of commitment uh, to that, uh, which is quite striking. Um, and uh, lots of things are in play. So uh, let's begin by looking at the impact of um, the the, the new era of revived sanctions uh, on Iran. There's a, uh, an economic crisis in Iran that may be uh, linked mainly or in part, depending on who you listen to, to uh, the new uh, sanctions. It's very hard to argue they haven't had uh, any serious impact. Uh, how far they'll go uh, isn't clear. And what impact the uh, economic crisis is having on politics and decision making in Iran also uh, remains unclear. President Trump said quite a while ago that he thought Iran was already a very different power. Uh, I don't know anybody else who thinks that uh, at the moment that Iran has greatly adjusted 
its um, uh, attitude towards the region and the world. So let's begin with uh, Professor Mosevian, Ambassador Mosevian, and, and ask him, uh, broadly speaking, what impact do you think the, the new sanctions and the new strategic situation is having on the political conversation and decision-making process uh, in Iran and the decisions that Iran is taking, its effects on its calculations? Please. Don't you want to start with the rule of ladies first? No, I actually want to start with you. Okay. <laughs> um, We're woke. The we impact do of uh, sanctions on Iranian economy, I would say definitely there is an impact. And negative consequences for foreign investments for banking relations, for trade, Iranian trade with outside, outside trade with Iran. There is no doubt there is uh, a heavy impact on the Iranian economy by the US uh, sanctions, the US withdrawal from the JCPOA. However, Iranian economy has been suffering since 1979, mostly because of its own domestic problem, like corruption, like dysfunctionality, like state-owned economy, like the failure of a real privatization. And I would say perhaps 30% is because of the US sanctions, 70% mm. is because of the Iranian domestic problems systematically, which all administrations they have failed to address. Uh, however, the, the mindset of people here like John Bolton, Pompeo is, that all these impacts during last year mm. has been just because of the US sanctions. Therefore, they are going to increase it. They are very much hopeful that Iran would collapse very soon. I don't believe there is any collapse because of the US sanctions. There is no regime change because of the US sanctions, although Iran would suffer. And, uh, the second impact is that nowadays they are looking for the first time to find ways and means to correct the problems of domestic problems like corruption, like privatization. Now there are huge efforts in order to resolve the domestic problem and the leader has called for resistance economy. It means uh, rely more on domestic capacity, capabilities than looking to the outside. On foreign policy, everyone knows here in this capital to school of thought of engaging Iran or confronting Iran has been existed since 1979 revolution. We have the same notion in GCC, some countries, some personalities in GCC, they really believe uh, GCC should engage with Iran like Oman and some other countries or personalities, they really believe we should fight Iran. An Iranian side also, uh, this has been the same since revolution 1979. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One school of thought has been saying engaging with the US. The other school of thought uh, has been insisting on resisting the US, confronting the US, fighting the US, and so. But we have never had between the major political factions inside Iran the necessity for confronting or fighting GCC. Since always all factions, moderates, conservatives, they really have believed continuously that we need to, to have good relation with GCC, 
there has never been hostility, animosity toward GCC. After the uh, President Trump withdrawal from the nuclear deal, and the fact was revealed, the alliance between Israel, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, behind the scene, on the scene, covertly, overtly, with uh, President Trump, with John Bolton, and all these news reports, facts you have seen during last three years and the GCC, I mean, when I say GCC, I don't mean countries like uh, Oman or even Qatar or even uh, Kuwait. It's more about you, uh, Saudi Arabia and UAE. They supported publicly, officially, uh, Trump withdrawal from the deal. The 12 points of Pompeo, which is a regime change policy and increasing sanctions against Iran. It was the public policy even uh, the terrorist attack in Ahwaz just two, three days ago, an Emirati official said this attack is not terrorist attack because it is against the military people. And it has, been, uh, it has not been uh, something confidential. We have publicly said we are going to take war inside Iran. Therefore, nowadays, the most important, I would say, change in Iranian foreign policy is creation of a new political factions that we should fight GCC, we should confront GCC. Okay, well, um, we'll discuss how new that is, but I appreciate very much the, uh, the overview. Uh, from, I think from their point of view, it, it may not seem like too much of a change, but I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, let's sort of um, broaden it a bit. Or no, actually, let's get more specific. Let's look at the economics of it. And no one better to help guide us through the, um, the economic uh, details than Basma, as, you know, political economy. I was going to say, I'm not an economist. No, no, the political economy, <laughs> the political impact. That's right, I agree. Right. There we go. So I appreciate uh, Ambassador Musavian's uh, analysis, yeah. and I think it's a very fair comment to say there's a 70-30 yeah, mix. I think that's really refreshing to hear. Um, and, and I think that Yo, part great. of this, uh, why we're at a head today, is there is really a perfect storm of many factors going on. Uh, one of them, of course, is uh, not to minimize it, uh, enormous environmental challenge right now mm. in parts of Iran. Uh, a drought, uh, this has caused a great deal of challenges for a lot mm. of the periphery communities, particularly on the border of Iraq, which tend to be a lot of ethnic minorities. And so we've mm. seen demonstrations uh, really for almost a year now in many of these communities, very much related to that. I think there's also been a shortage of hard currency. And this is partly because of, yes, 30% is external, but that's causing a lot of unease because, of course, a great deal of Iran's economy is dependent on oil exports. Mm. And so we're seeing, in fact, I think there is, it's fair to say, a capital outflow, money leaving the country. Some of that is obviously the economic elite, but there's also a lack of real uh, investments in the country. Uh, many foreign companies, particularly in the oil sector, which requires, regardless of um, capability, mm. it requires continuous maintenance. I think that's really underappreciated often about the oil sector. And so we're seeing a lot of companies, whether it's Total and others, uh, increasingly finding it difficult to take on the potential uh, fear of sanctions uh, ramifications that would come uh, in the coming months. And so they're really pulling out slowly and surely. I'm um, happy to talk about the details of the sanctions. I think we're going to do that maybe in the next session. Yeah, we will, definitely. So there is a shortage of that, uh, shortage of hard currency, uh, de decrease of foreign investment. And one thing that actually doesn't get a lot of attention but surely did in Iran itself was mm. the banking sector. And that's part of the internal corruption problem. In fact, um, the Iranian banking sector had allowed at one point uh, very recently to have some of these mom and pop type banks, uh, very familiar to that here in the United mm. States where there are rural banks, etc. But increasingly in Iran, some of these were actually attached to clerics mm. and they didn't do very well. Uh, the loosening of the regulations, what it did in fact is a mini savings and loans crisis. For those right. of you who are familiar with what happened here in the United States, we saw a similar situation in parts of Iran. And so many, many investors, small individual ones who had savings, 
savings, found their savings just gone uh, overnight. And that also, I think, created uh, a great deal of, of lack of confidence in the, in the internal banking sector. Wasn't that one sector. of the drivers of some of the protests Absolutely. last year? Absolutely. Absolutely. Early this year, late last year. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. that brings me to the bigger problem that I think uh, uh, Ambassador Musiviana pointed to, which is that feeling of corruption. It is really, uh, and I appreciate that 70% analysis because so mm. much of it is tied to the feeling that indeed the clerical establishment has their hands in so many bits of things, right? Mm. The banking sector to some of the banyads, you know, mm. it, it, steel manufacturing, you name it, they're there. Uh, these state-owned enterprises, uh, they feed into um, the, the, the coffers of including the notorious IRGC. And so there's this great feeling that somebody's doing really well at this. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the saying of, you know, the, the, the there's plenty of Range Rovers and uh, Jaguars on the streets of Tehran. Who's driving these? And suddenly, if you start to do the math of where the, that, that is, or do the linkages, uh, they often relate back to uh, some very uh, influential clerics. So the clerics are doing well, but you know somehow the average you know middle class is not. And that's yeah. causing a lot of frustration. And of course, I think very uh, pointedly and smartly, <laughs> if that's a word, uh, I would say Rouhani last December released some numbers. I think it was very much related to his office or people who support him that showed where the, the clerics are putting their money. And it was pretty appalling what they're doing with that, including some clerics getting $150,000 for a sermon. Mm. I mean, there was just some really outrageous numbers. Some of these schools getting an enormous amount of money, of course, included in that is, you know, billions of dollars spent on foreign adventures, uh, including, of course, Syria propping up the Assad regime, uh, Lebanon's Hezbollah, to a lesser extent, perhaps Yemen. And that, I think, caused that great deal of frustration that, look, there's capital inside the country, but it's just not being invested and somebody is profiting. Mm. And it really relates back to the clerical establishment. So I think that is creating that perfect storm of an economic you know, a pressure, a pressure cooker. Um, and it doesn't help that, of course, there's no, there's no uh, confidence, neither in the political or economic class, to uh, continue to invest in the country. And that really is the recipe of the kind of economic challenges the country faces today. Has it had any impact on, I mean, uh, Ambassador Musavian was really kind of suggesting some kind of impact that uh, the economic situation could have had on um, domestic uh, conversation and decision making. You you hinted at it, uh, but I, I you know I'm just sort of wondering. A, first of all, would you like to uh, elaborate on that a little bit? And then I'd I'd like I'd like to hear from both of you about that, and then we'll bring in Ali. But uh, you know I'd invite you to kind of yeah they elaborate they on. have uh, started to find uh, ways regulations rules to deeply fight corruption. Mm. This already has started mm -hmm. in Parliament and in the Cabinet. Already one one uh, point Basma said, this mm. is what, when Rouhani said, we are going to have a budget for the people uh, behind the glass. Every person in Iran should see every detail of the mm. budget. Transparency. Transparency. Mm -hmm. This is just one small step. This is not big step. Mm. but created a lot of domestic debate why yeah. the budget should go to this organization or mm -hmm. that organization. Mm -hmm. However, uh, we have been, uh, during Ahmadinejad, FATF was uh, introduced. There was no domestic discussion whether Iran should join FATF or not. Mm. Zero domestic challenge. That's why the Iranian economy minister signed, and even 99% of Iranian people, they didn't know about the issue. But after uh, President Trump withdrawal of JCPOA, we have had the most important domestic pol uh, political challenge, challenging issue mm. about FATF. Mm. After JCPOA, the domestic fighting or challenge has been about FATF mm. because they say now this is JCPOA number two. Yeah. They are going to impose on Iran and then they are going to withdraw and they are going not to deliver their commitments mm. because then after FATF, there should be good bank banking relations and so and so. When they got you there, 
then they say, sorry, we are not going to give you any concession, no good bank so relations. It's being framed as a trap. Yeah, basically. there is domestic fighting now, but I, my, my assumption, my understanding is that uh, at the end, the political establishment of the country, including the parliament, National Security Council, government, and even the leader himself, they would agree. This would be a big step because mm -hmm. it is about money laundering, terrorism. This would bring huge transparency about mm -hmm. the banking system of mm -hmm. Iran. That's why I think uh, 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 they are heading to uh, toward a better domestic situation, but at the same time, while the U.S. pressures would continue, mm. this practically uh, would impede uh, very much the, the, the uh, capability of Iranian officials to deliver what they want to do. Mm. So two questions, then, Basma. First of all, uh, I mean, do you agree that there's a potential for greater transparency as a result of these pressures? And secondly, would, would that, and two questions, and one, if that is plausible, um, would that really help people tolerate the reality better, the fact that they know the details? Would that, would that make it any less annoying? And secondly, what about the impact on uh, the ability of, of the, the country to have its the rather ambitious uh, foreign policy that it's had. Um, is that something that can be constrained because the public gets more details about how money is spent and doesn't like it? Or is that just more transparency without any change? I don't know. Well, I mean, I think the, the essence of this boils down to is who is to blame, right? Yeah. And there is the clerics, of course, the clerical establishment and the government, the Rouhani government. Mm. And the point is that I think transparency serves the government. It serves mm. Rouhani to be able to say, look, this is what I have to deal with. This is the finances that I have. And look at what the IRGC and the clerical establishment is using um, and wasting. Uh, that really does serve, uh, I think, the Rouhani government. The challenge, though, and the bigger issue is, frankly, there is a crisis of confidence even today in the government itself. Mm. Right. And so that is not does not bode well for, for Rouhani. I mean, we were talking about this on the sidelines earlier that increasingly he's not seen as someone who's effective to get Iran out of this mess from his even from his own previous support base. The liberal middle class that would have voted for him increasingly don't feel like there's going to be change mm. fast enough. So the crisis of confidence absolutely is a financial one. But I think one thing that, uh, and unfortunately, I think the Trump administration doesn't realize is that as they squeeze Iran, they're empowering the clerics. Yeah. They're empowering the clerics because there's just more pressure on Rouhani, mm -hmm. and he looks like he's failing when, in effect, there are indeed, and I agree with the administration's you know, very legitimate complaints about the wastefulness of the IRGC and the mm. clerics, but the, the the mechanism being used to pressure the government is making it more difficult for the Rouhani government to survive. Yeah, I've never seen sanctions open up more inputs for decision making. It almost always constricts somehow or another. But uh, Ali, I apologize for uh, the lateness of bringing you in. What we haven't heard much of so far, either from the ambassador or Professor Momani, is is the uh, the extent to which any of this conversation is making any changes to Iran's strategic calculations, strategic decision making, et cetera. What do you think? So, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for providing me with this opportunity to share my <clears throat> analysis with you. Uh, having two Iranians uh, in a panel, uh, we owe you at least one Iranian joke. And so I will, <laughs> even in, in the darkest days, you know, we really need to brighten up the day with, with one of those jokes. So, so the joke goes that there is a, an Iranian mom who wants her daughter to marry a suitable young Iranian gentleman. Uh, you know, they have a conversation, the daughter and the suitable young gentleman, and then she comes back to the mom and says, Mom, you know, how do you expect me to, to marry this man? He's an atheist. Mm -hmm. He doesn't believe in heaven. He doesn't believe in hell. And the mom says, darling, you get married, and the two of us will convince him that hell truly exists. Now, <laughs> President Trump is trying to convince Mr. Khamenei and the rulers of the Islamic Republic of Iran that hell truly exists. Now, what is the Trumpian hell for the regime in Iran? It is the Iranian currency in free fall, it's lack of foreign direct investments, and from November, almost 
almost something resembling oil embargo. Mm. Which limits and severely restricts the Islamic Republic's ability to help and finance its allies in the Middle East region mm -hmm. and engage in foreign adventures in the Middle East region. Now, the, the leaders, they're facing a very clear choice, either to feed the Iranian public mm -hmm. or continue engaging in those adventures in the Middle East region. The choice, however, is made difficult for Tehran because of a very simple factor. A struggle for power within the Islamic Republic, which has everything to do with what happens after Ayatollah Khamenei no longer is among us. In other words, the regime elites are already preparing themselves for post Khamenei phase. Mm -hmm. They are trying to win the struggle for power. They are trying to position themselves for that situation. And the IRGC really does not mind that President Rouhani gets the blame for the economic problems of mm. Iran. They do not mind that we have people going to the streets chanting slogans against Mr. Rouhani and even sometimes against Mr. Khamenei. If you like, make, make a statistical analysis of the slogans and chants uh, which were used by the demonstrators and protesters in, in Iran since December of 17, what we see is that 25% uh, were against Mr. Khamenei, 50% mm. were against Mr. Rouhani and, and, and what they perceive as incompetence of the government, which is very tragic because President Rouhani is one of the most competent presidents in the history of the Islamic Republic. And then there is some criticism of the IRGC and its engagements in Syria uh, and in Iraq. That calculation is not a very bad one from mm. the viewpoint of the Revolutionary Guards. If it helps them seize power the moment that Mr. Khamenei no longer is there. Mm. So they are ready to run a terrible political risk mm. by making life extremely hard and difficult for Mr. Rouhani. This is what makes everything even more difficult. This is not only a struggle between the United States and, and, and Iran. It's also a fight within the regime mm. and a fight for what will come the moment that Mr. Khamenei no longer is there. Okay. Let's um, look a little further uh, out from uh, Iran's internal conversation, which you're all welcome to keep talking about if you, if you want to respond or if you want to say anything, that's, that's totally fine. But I'd like to introduce a second theme now, uh, which is um, Iran and the rest of the world. Uh, you know, there's a kind of diplomatic standoff uh, right now with the United States based on the United States withdrawing from the JCPOA. Obviously, both Iran and the United States think that they're operating from different kinds of strengths from positions of different advantage. Uh, but it strikes me that there is going to be a, a limit to what both can accomplish, and we're starting to see already, I think, uh, where those limits are vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Iran's efforts to isolate the United States, in quote, the uh, United States' hope or anyone's hope for regime change in Iran, both seem to me probably, uh, you know, overly ambitious to say the least. Uh, so at a certain point, the dust settles and, you, and both sides realize that you achieved whatever you think you might be able to under these situations, and you have to look for the next step. Uh, and then with Europe, the uh, effort to keep the JCPOA going uh, either for a while or until you can find a vehicle to bring the United States back into it or to create a substitute for it, especially through the spe special purpose uh, vehicles, which I'm going to ask you about. But in general, uh, can you talk about the, the, the broader relationship of Iran uh, to Europe and to the United States, especially to the United States at this point? And let's begin with that, uh, Ambassador. With your, with your permission, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I would like to make two comments on what Ali said. Yeah, please. Absolutely. There is such a narrative, conventional understanding here in Washington and even in the region is that if they put more pressure, Iran would be in position to choose either people or the region. But if someone goes in the Iranian strategy in the region, you would understand it is very different with the US or Saudi Arabia or Emirates. Mm. 
if the U.S. has spent seven trillions, Saudis they have spent in Yemen or other countries trillions. Iranians they don't spend too much, and because they work on nation capacity building rather than military war expenditure, you know. If they have created al hasht al-Shabi in Iraq, this is a part of nation which is going to resist the U.S. for decades to come. Therefore, really, this is not only the case. I, I, I bet you you would see next year or next two years the Iranian strategy in the region would remain, their domestic problem would remain, and they would handle Perfectly or imperfectly both, you know, right? It is not, it is not something you, you, you believe, okay, because of the sanction, Iran is going to leave the region soon. This is not going to happen. And second, the fact is I see much more unity between political factions of Iran after President Trump withdrawal. Less pressure on moderate Rouhani than ever during his presidency. Therefore, it is creating unity between the big uh, figures and political factions in the country to resist the U.S. and the regional triangle. Mm. Now I'm coming to uh, the second part of the debate Hossein mentioned. I would say uh, on Iran foreign relations, one, as I mentioned in the first part, the two school of thought in Iran, engaging or confronting the U.S. At the moment, none of the major political factors are advocating engaging with the U.S. Therefore, negotiation with the U.S., engaging with the U.S. is going to at least die for at least one or two, three years. Mm -hmm. And everybody now comes to uh, uh, confirm the leader position who was saying from the beginning, do not tr trust the U.S. even if you negotiate, even if you agree, they, they would violate it. He was saying from 2013, ongoing, nonstop, ultimately the Iranians understand he was right. The second consequences is about uh, in, uh, improvement, uh, expansion of Iran's relation with the Eastern Bloc. Mm because Iranian uh, core policy strategy always has been trying to keep a balance mm. between East and West. But nowadays, uh, practically Iranians are pushed to have much more comprehensive relation with Russia, China, India, and Eastern Bloc. And Ayatollah Khamenei publicly four or five months ago said, we are not going to count on relation with the West anymore. Mm. We would invest on East. And the third important uh, implication of the policy is what I said in the previous panel. Iran has always considered Israel enemy number one, the U.S. enemy number two, or vice versa, or the same. Mm -hmm. um, they have been. But now they say Saudi Arabia, Emirate, they are the same as Israel and the U.S. This is extremely dangerous to my understanding and it's a big shift in Iranian regional uh, understanding about the, the, the neighbors. Uh, I would say on the uh, months to come, the U.S., uh, Hussein, I believe already the U.S. has been isolated on the JCPOA. Mm. It is a fact. But Iranians, they believe the U.S. would be totally defeated and totally isolated. I don't believe it's going to happen. Exactly. Because every country, when they are going to choose between Iran and the U.S., ultimately they would choose U.S. They would be very point. unhappy with Trump, and they would blame President Trump, but they would keep good relation with the U.S. because their economic interest is there. Mm. However... The next uh, implication or impact of Trump policy is a new school of thought or thinking in Iran, how we can manage relation with the West minus the US. 
That's why Iran is investing so much on Europe. Mm. And that's why Iran, although Iran is saying we are not going to have any type of regional negotiation with the U.S., but practically they have started negotiating with EU on right. Yemen. Right. Therefore, they are going to see whether Europe would be able to deliver. Mm. They know Europe cannot deliver up to 100 percent. Mm. But they are going to see whether at least the Europeans would be able to deliver 50% or not. But JCPOA began with Iran and Europe many yes, of years course. before. Yes, and yes. then that slowly yes. morphed into JCPOA. Yes. So that would be the logical, yeah. the repetition of that would be a logical way of creating a substitute or fixing it or something. Yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, Ali, you had some uh, comments? Uh, Thank you. The, the really and truly remarkable development this time around with the external and internal pressure against the regime is that historically uh, the ruling elites of the regime would stick together. Mm. They would unify in a unified front in order to protect uh, the survival of, of the regime. This time around, we do not see that tendency. The ruling elites of the Islamic Republic are actually disunited mm. because of the very fact that, I, uh, that, that they are preparing for succession after Mr. Khamenei. Let me give you a few examples. Uh, many of the protests against the Rouhani government, against rising prices, against performance of the government, were actually instigated <clears throat> by the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps. And it's not me saying this. Listen to Mr. Hassan Medina Ashana, one of the advisors of the presidents. Listen to Mr. Esar Jahangiri, first vice president. Those two individuals and a number of parliamentarians supporting Mr. Rouhani were all out accusing the Revolutionary Guards of instigating, supporting, and logistically giving a lot of coverage in their own media as a part of their struggle against the Rouhani administration. Mm -hmm. They think it's perfectly fine that there is public demonstration against Rouhani mm -hmm. because they believe it helps them seize power the day that Mr. Khamenei no longer is there. The second part is about US-Iran negotiations. Mm -hmm. Now, I respectfully disagree with, with Ambassador Musavian. Ambassador Musavian believes that there is no interest in Tehran whatsoever to negotiate with the United States. Uh, just by reading the press, you actually see that, see that there is plenty of interest. President Rouhani himself said that Iran and the U.S. can have the mother of all peace or mother of all uh, wars, as he, he said, quoting uh, Saddam Hussein. God knows why he <laughs> found it a necessity to, to quote Saddam Hussein, uh, whose destiny we, we, we all know. But clearly, that was a signal that he was ready to engage in negotiations with the U.S. government. In a televised interview, he also emphasized that Mr. Zarif, uh, the foreign minister of Iran, actually had negotiations with Foreign Minister Tillerson in the United States last year on the sides of the UN General Assembly. In other words, the signal he was sending was that we have no problem negotiating with the government of President Trump. Another and more surprising signal from Tehran came from no one but Major General Qasem Soleimani, the chief commander of the Quds Force. In an address in Hamadan, he mentioned secret correspondence between himself and General Petraeus in Iraq. He mentioned that correspondence three to four times, saying, you Americans needed our help to reduce your casualty numbers in Iraq. We did help you. So in other words, the signal he was sending was that talk with us, do not talk with Rouhani. Hmm. So in other words, rather than having a problem with Tehran, not willing to engage in negotiations and a dialogue with Washington, we are actually facing a situation where there are two different parties, very eager to talk with Washington and very eager to prevent each other to, pre to talk with, with, with Washington. That is the issue. Okay, quick response, and then we're going to bring no, in No, I should take Ali reports. to Tehran to take him to Qom, and then he oh, But please don't. <laughs> <laughs> then, then he would understand, I told us, normally in Iran they live over nine years. Hmm. 
uh, up to 100 years. Ayatollah Khamenei is just eight years old. Sure. Therefore, don't think about too much about what after Ayatollah Khamenei. Second, uh, there was no meeting between Tillerson and Zarif. Whatever you read in media is just baseless. I know the details. It was between Iran and the P5 plus one. And before the meeting, Iranian American foreign minister, they told the organizers, make sure our seats would be far away from each other. <laughs> Therefore, it is not true. Last year, President Trump invited Rouhani, and it was completely unexpected. During two days' stay, eight times he approached Rouhani. Rouhani declined. And then Trump called um, uh, President Macron, please intermediate, I want to meet him. Macron called Rouhani, and he said, if you cannot, if you don't, we can have trilateral meeting. Rouhani said, no. With these policies, no one in Iran can meet and negotiate with President Trump. And the last one about what uh, Qasem Soleimani said about the correspondence. Since Afghanistan 2001, there has been too many correspondence between Iranian American generals in the region. It has nothing to do with the recent issues. Um, OK, so let's uh, bring Basma back into this and, and really also think about the European role, uh, if you could. Um, right now, as I understand it, uh, in order to try to keep the JCPOA alive, um, you know, for many more months and into the foreseeable future. Um, they're working on a special purpose vehicle to pay for uh, contracts for those continuing to do business in Iran to bypass U.S. banking sanctions. And so can you tell us about, I mean, how, how's, now how are they, what are the Europeans doing to try to keep this going? And will they, would they be able to, what's the role of the Europeans? And, and we, we seem to have some kind of agreement about their centrality in, um, in repairing damage. But how do you see it, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to the economic angle? Well, but both. I mean, so, I mean, I think the European role is essential because in many ways, um, they also keep the hope alive uh, mm. for the economy. Uh, mm. And that's obviously, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the crisis of confidence in the economy is a big problem. Mm. And so having the EU play a prominent role is key. Of course, uh, EU is the number one destination for Iranian oil. About 70% mm. of all Iranian oil goes to uh, uh, goes to the EU. So it's a very important partner. I mean, I think that this SPV, this special purpose vehicle, this, f you know, it's a, basically a a fund whereby um, there will be, and it, it doesn't have to be just the EU, it includes companies and countries across the world, can sell their oil to Iran and deposit the money mm -hmm. into this fund. Uh, th this doesn't expire, that doesn't have to be used right away, it's almost like a credit line that mm. then can be used by Iran to purchase particularly yeah. European goods um, to sort of help its domestic market. I think Would it successfully protect everyone from American? No. No. So right. basically, this, this is what I, I think the, tre the Treasury Department's very clear, and I think they, uh, as John Bolton has very much uh, reiterated, they will yeah, find today. you and seek you out, and, and, you know, if you plan on doing business with Iran, uh, they're not going to allow this to go down he, quietly he, into he the night. He was clear about that today. Absolutely. Yeah. However, here's the issue. Look at who are uh, Iran's key key partners. These, peop these countries, I should say, don't really care about the United States sanctions. Mm. So think about Russia, China. Those are two important mm. partners. Frankly, they're under their own, and particularly China is increasingly being, you know, facing this, this tariff war with the, with the United States. They just don't care what the Americans have to say mm. about this. That's one thing. Turkey, India, again, not very big partners to the United States economy. I think these are the countries that are going to keep this alive. The countries that will fall in line, South Korea, Japan, mm -hmm. absolutely. And they are key destinations for Iranian oil. They will completely fall in line, particularly for sort of historical reasons. Countries and then the EU, and this is where it gets really tricky, because if there are companies that have a lot of business in the United States, think of some of the French uh, conglomerates, the very big ones, whether it's Airbus or Total. Mm -hmm. And we saw Airbus leave very early, um, you know, because partly, you know, the 10% of Airbus's production is happening in the United States. They can't afford right. to alienate a little vast market like the United States in favor of Iran. Mm. But if you look at some of the European countries, Italy, for example, it's a lot of small, medium-sized enterprises that are actually dealing with Iran. 
They don't have a big market in the United States. So I think it'll be on a company by company level. Mm. And I think the tolerance, the risk will be assessed at a company level. And certainly those large global giants that we know of, the Totals, the Airbus, you know, the, the BASF in Germany, for example, they will stop dealing with Iran. Mm. The smaller ones, they are keen on getting customers and they will work with Iran and particularly some of these smaller um, oil and gas uh, type uh, firms they will certainly keep going with Iran. And I think that's uh, going to give the government some lifeline. Uh, are there things, though, that the big players can do that a swarm of little ones can't? I would imagine the answer is yes, but I don't know. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but I think that this is where, you know, again, some of, you know, some of these larger companies, I mean, against the one thing that, you know, I think is a tragedy is that, you know, they're both Boeing and Airbus are pulling mm. out of this because the, the commercial airline system in Iran, is, it's so unfair. This is just, you know, average Iranians are going to suffer if there's another incident in the sky. So sure. this is one that really needs to be thought of. But yeah. I think there are plenty of competitors out there. And, and certainly in mm. most sectors, uh, there will be there will be, again, an opportunity for Iran to continue to do mm. business with the world. But that doesn't take away from the 70 percent that Ambassador yeah. Musavian very, you know, articulately, very poignantly here, which is the real problem. And that 70 percent is really on the onus of the government. In internal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's let's um, broaden the aperture one more time and bring in the regional powers. Let's, let's talk especially about uh, relations between Iran and um, the Gulf countries, especially Saudi Arabia and the UAE, but others too, uh, in this new uh, economic and strategic environment. And it's a very interesting uh, interview with uh, Anwar Gargash, the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs of the UAE, in the, it was two parts in the National a uh, couple of days ago. And he spoke about Iran, and he said a couple of very interesting things. First, he said that uh, the Gulf countries should be part of any new conversation with Iran about JCPOA-related issues, uh, about uh, weapon, about um, missile development, mm -hmm. and about Iran's regional um, agenda or activities, policies, however you want to put it. Uh, and not only that, he suggested that uh, there should be a dialogue anyway between the Gulf countries and Iran, that they need their own, not just to be at the table, but to have their own table with Iran, which is a little bit different than what's usually said. Uh, and he also was at pains to say the purpose of uh, the policy of these countries, at least of, of Riyadh and Abu Dhabi, is not uh, regime change in Iran or instability or war or violence. Uh, but uh, to press for policy change and to get a different dialogue going. On the other hand, you also have this recent attack uh, inside Iran by uh, domestic insurgents um, and uh, really strong accusations uh, by Iran pointing the finger at the United States, uh, at Gulf countries, and uh, by implication at Israel for uh, this and similar actions. Uh, and people in uh, positions of influence in the Gulf basically um, almost celebrating it, if, or certainly at least smiling at, at uh, this development and welcoming this development. Um, so that's pushing very much in the other direction. So let's talk a little bit before we bring the audience in about where we think that this relationship is, and uh, maybe we can also spend some time talking about how we can get out of it, which is something that the ambassador and I have given some thought to in the past. Let me begin with you. Yeah, with Hussein, uh, we have already discussed many times and we have written. Uh, my belief is that Iran, GCC, and Iraq for a sustainable long-term peace, stability uh, in the region, they need to establish a regional cooperation security organization. And they need to create a regional cooperation mutually between the six countries of GCC, Iraq and Iran, all eight countries around Persian Gulf borrowing security from outside is not going to be sustainable. Mm. Brits, they left. Americans, they would leave. And are we going to look after bringing another superpower to succeed the US or Brits? Or I would say the best is 
to uh, cooperate to maintain the security peace by the regional countries and get equal balance support by five permanent members of United Nations Security Council. The JCPOA was approved by the UN Security Council. Such a regional cooperation system, we would need to negotiate to engage between all regional countries and all five permanent members, because ultimately they are responsible for maintaining peace, security, stability in the world. This is the substance of the idea I believe we need to work, we need to insist, we need to promote. However, it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen at one night mm -hmm. because the mistrust is huge, the gap is huge, blame, mutual blames, and we need to have some measures as a confidence building measures in order to create a better ground for entering such a uh, major regional strategic cooperation. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, I would say the first is to start dialogue. Unfortunately, there is no negotiation, no talk mm -hmm. between Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, and Emirate while Iran and Saudi Arabia are the most important countries in the Persian Gulf. Mm. And Saudi Arabia practically is dominating the GCC. It is a reality, I mean. And I never forget when I was mediating to uh, improve Iran-Saudi Arabia in mid-1990s as representative of late Afsanjani, the late King Fahad told me exactly the same. He told me ultimately the three powers in this region, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Iraq, mm -hmm. they need to get together to create a regional cooperation system. But that time he mentioned to me Americans would not let. But this is the, uh, number one. There are many issues I believe that can be a phased approach to create mm -hmm. uh, a better understanding or less tension. If you are talking about the regional issues, the regional crisis, I think Iranians uh, in negotiation with Europe, they have already transferred the message that if Saudis, they believe their failure of three years war in Yemen is because of Iran supporting Houthis, which is not really. If they really believe this is, Iran is ready to facilitate dialogue between Saudis, Houthis, and to resolve uh, Yemen crisis. Uh, uh, and every assurances Saudis they need for their security because Yemen is immediate security issue for Saudis. I believe if you are talking about big issues in the region, mm -hmm. this would be the most realistic one mm -hmm. for Iran and Saudis to cooperate, to cooperate because really Yemen, it is not a big issue for mm -hmm. Iran if Saudis and uh, 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 are ready to embrace Yemenis, all big factions. Mm -hmm. However, in this region, we have many other issues. I mean, Iranians, they believe Saudis, Emiratis are after regime change. Emiratis, uh, Saudis, they believe Iran is after regime change. Mm -hmm. Therefore, what we would lose if they, we have a, a security uh, committee between Iran and GCC just to discuss their security concern, whether this is terrorism, whether this is regime change, whether this is interferences or what. I mean, at least the security uh, organizations, they can sit together in this region and they can talk. We have much more confidence building measures uh, which I, I don't believe we have time to discuss. Well, could you begin that dialogue with maritime security? Because it seems to me that that's yeah. an obvious yeah. place where they share an interest and they don't talk yeah. about something they really need yeah. to cooperate on. 
Uh, I, I would agree. I would really think that's agree, that's a potential so. subject. So uh, without giving you much direction, I, I would ask first Besman and Ali to to uh, sort of give give your response to what the uh, ambassador has said and the whole question mm -hmm. about uh, dialogue within the Gulf region. I don't see it happening anytime well, soon. Uh, it seems really unlikely. Um, yes. Even on the Strait of Hormuz, I mean, I agree that there is uh, an interest in keeping the water uh, open with safe passage to all, but all sides like to use it as a weapon, you mm -hmm. know, just, just to be bombastic Even about threaten each other. Exactly. And so I think that there's a lot of, uh, you know, continued tension. I think it's hard to get to that point of dialogue when there are so many ongoing conflicts. Syria, of course, comes to mind. Uh, mm. That is a sore point in every Arab Gulf country. And mm. I would say the masses of Arab people, uh, particularly seeing the, mm. what was the lifeline given to the Assad regime was really at the hands of the Iranian uh, government. And so that is going to be very difficult to have until Syria is solved or, or finished in some way. Uh, I think both, again, Iraq and Lebanon is another, you know, another two areas where, again, mm. not direct conflict, but Iran's heavy handedness in is, is just a, is an enormous sore point. Uh, I think mm. it's sad because uh, this this is translated into the kind of sectarianism that has engulfed the entire region. Uh, I don't think it's fair to um, to, to pit these, uh, uh, you know, particularly Shia communities, fifth columns, mm. but increasingly as Iran uh, supports groups like Hezbollah, which I don't think anyone could disagree with, and Hezbollah's leader has been very uh, uh, proud to say on television that as long as Iran exists, we will be alive and well. Mm -hmm. And so as long as there's that heavy-handed involvement um, by Iran, which it's doing for its own interest, and kudos to them, because any smart country would do that, but it is causing so much... Uh, I think, uh, pain and trouble for many parts of the region. And so that, I think, is some core issues that need to be addressed. It's it's mm. it's tricky. It's tough. Uh, of course, you bring in Yemen to this. And now the fact that we have a brand new front of challenges of Arab minorities in mm -hmm. Iran, uh, in the Ahvaz region, I mean, that's really just a lot to discuss uh, at the table. So I don't, I'm not hopeful that this is going to happen soon. Mm. But I think you need to get rid of some of these big issues. Syria, Syria, Syria is a big one. Yeah. Uh, and a, even though I would say the Gulf countries have pulled out uh, for all, you know, uh, and, you know, intents and purposes, they're not really active on on the Syria file anymore. But they certainly do care, um, and Iran continues to be a, a menace in the region, particularly in Syria. And I think that that's going to be very difficult for mm. uh, many of these Gulf countries to to sit around the table as long as that's quite alive and well. Yeah, Ali, what are your thoughts on all of this? One of, the, one of the fundamental flaws of the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, was that the competent government of uh, President Rouhani seriously believed it was possible to bypass the regional players, such as the Saudis, the Emiratis, and you know, not to forget the Israelis, and make peace with the United States. They believed it was possible to obtain and achieve a durable, peace with the U.S. by bypassing all these regional actors. History has, of course, shown that it was not possible. The question is if the competent technocratic elites of the Islamic Republic have learned anything from that lesson, so they will pursue a different strategy in the future and will try to improve relations with Washington simultaneous with improvement of relations with the regional actors and Israel or not. The second issue is making my, 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 me, me less, less optimistic, and it is that Tehran is not acting or speaking with a singular voice because of the ongoing struggle for power within Iran, regardless uh, how long uh, ayatollahs tend to live, as, mm. as Ambassador Musavian suggests. Recently, we saw uh, Ayatollah Rafsanjani uh, meeting his end in a swimming pool in, in, in Tehran. Uh, rather than unexpectedly, uh, who knows what shortens life or prolongs life for the clerical leadership uh, in, in, in the Islamic Republic. And as long as there is calculation about who is going to be the next leader and how individual actors within the regime can achieve power, by outmaneuvering the other party, I think it's very, very difficult to expect uh, immediate improvement of rela relations between Iran and the regional players. Okay, very good. Well, I mean, I, I'd like to actually, if you had no, no, one more, no. yeah, I think we should bring the audience in at this stage. 
uh, and invite your uh, questions, brief comments. Please um, identify yourself uh, before making your uh, question, brief comment. And we'll begin with you, sir, then you, and then we'll go around. So first you, sir. Uh, there's a microphone, please, I should say. Thank you very My much. My name is Karim Abdian. I'm the executive director of Ahwaz Human Rights Organization, okay, a UN-recognized yeah. NGO in support of minority, Arab minorities in Iran. Okay. Well, I have a comment and a question for Ambassador Musa Bian. Okay. I thought the domestic aspect somehow was overlooked, was mostly emphasis on economic, deliberately or not. But here's the, the Mr. Ambassador says something which is typical of the Islamic Republic about Ahwaz, you know, and he said that, you know, Ahwaz incident was as a result and insinuating that the Saudis are behind it because the Saudi prince last year, and he's right, said that we will take the fight to the Iranians. Here's my question, if you allow me. Mm. So that's typical of, I am an Ahwazi Arab. Mm. We think our land, seven million people, we are under the Persian central government occupation. Mm. We're occupied. Okay. So one is we're not allowed to rebel against sure. the central government. It has to be either American, Israeli, or someone. Now, it's very interesting but, that, yeah. the, that the uh, uh, Islamic Republic promote the Palestinian and their occupation of the Israelis can uh, rebel against the Israeli, but right. we so, Arabs are Baluch and everything so is, cannot. Is but lastly, one, okay. one, one, my Go question ahead. is specifically that. Okay. Mr. Ambassador, if you think, let's suppose that there is, the Saudis are behind it. And why is that bad when the Iranians allow themselves okay. to interfere in Iraq, right. Syria, Yemen, Lebanon, gotcha. and all of okay, that? Yeah. But other countries, Good. American, Israeli, and Saudis cannot Got it. Uh, enter into this. Uh, uh, Good. Okay, so yeah, and in fact, I think that is something you see on Twitter quite a lot from many people in, in the uh, Arab Gulf countries as well, which is the idea that, and, and if it were, well then, so what, wouldn't that be Iran getting a taste of its own medicine? Mm -hmm. So it's, that's the question for you. Would, would... No, I think you just need to look at the map of Iran for thousands of years, and you will see whether Ahwaz has been occupied or not. You can see thousands of years. Not only Ahwaz, not only Khuzestan, many countries, they have been part of Iran. Therefore, this is really baseless to say Iran has occupied Ahwaz. Just look at the maps for 7,000 years yeah. and see when, where, which date Ahwaz has been separate, that, state or... But that isn't really the question. The question is... No, the is, question yeah. is this. Yeah. Saddam invaded Iran, announced Khuzestan part of Iraq. It was clear it was a war started by an Arab country to disintegrate Iran and GCC supported. Since then, there is no doubt the GCC, they are and they have been after disintegration of Iran. It doesn't matter whether this is in Baluchistan or Ahwaz or other states. Iranians, they would definitely fight for it. If 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 there is if know, there is but... if there is, uh, Iranians are proud of their history. If mm. you are not, Iranians they are very proud of their culture, civilization. Once they have lost many countries to uh, ex-Soviet Union, they are not going to let mm. it again. Yeah. They fought eight years, mm. lost hundreds of thousands of soldiers to keep the integrity of the country, and that's the way to go. Okay. Therefore, but if there is a vacuum or shortage uh, for the rights of minorities, whether this is Kurd or Shia or Sunni, or this is something else, I believe this should well, be addressed in proper way, not with terrorist activities. That, that's all fine, but that wasn't really the question, which is, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try restating it and see if, if we can get an answer, and if not, not, uh, which was, um, it, it, it doesn't this look a lot like uh, Iran's own activities in the region for the past 25 <coughs> years? That, I think that's really the question. And so, in other words, it, um, complaints about this from the Iranian government appear very no, unconvincing. Hussein, I think I think I answered already. Uh, 
out? Yes. Okay. My answer was that right after revolution, mm. when there was no Hezbollah issue, mm -hmm. no Daesh, yeah. nothing, yeah, yeah. just some months after revolution, okay, Saddam I, I invaded point. Iran, and the GCC supported disintegration uh, of Iran. I get your point. All right. Iran didn't start it. Well, no, Iran no, no, didn't no, no. start it. It's okay. No, we're not. It was have a started by no, our Arab neighbors. We're, we're not going to have a. We're not. Hold on. We're not going to have a debate. No, 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 no. Wait. We're okay. No, no. Please, sir. No, sir. Sir. No. No, sir. We're not going to have a debate, an ad hoc debate on the floor. We have other panelists, both of whom would like to speak to this. I think we'll we'll welcome them. Thank you for your question, but I think we're going to keep it orderly. So Basma, please, and then um, uh, Ali, and we'll quickly we'll wrap the, this up pretty uh, quickly, quickly. on quickly the Ahvaz, the I mean, question. you know, the terror attack. Uh, ISIS took credit for it. That's something people are not talking about right. enough. You know, on the Amak. Uh, on their own um, little channel network, whatever, they took credit for it, and that they doesn't happen of very stuff. often. Right. Um, but there's a lot of proof that they provided along the way. I think there is a big issue, though. I mean, one of the things that when we look at the protests, a lot of this was happening in the periphery. This is mm. an important phenomenon in areas where there are ethnic minorities and religious minorities. And that's something to be really, I think, to be talked about because mm. Tehran, you know, the revolutionary spirit of 2009 did not happen again. But yet, it's certainly in the periphery, in these areas, people are, are the most, I think, uh, feeling the pinch of lack of services, mm. uh, you know, dirty water water, yeah, lack of electricity. I mean, there is a failure of governance mm -hmm. in much of the periphery. And it is, I think, related to, frankly, a discrimination against these minorities. It, it is tied to that. Mm -hmm. And I would flip it because it happens in Arab countries, too. So this yeah, is, sure. there's, trust me, they're all hypocrites. <laughs> Every one of these governments are hypocrites. They treat their minorities badly, both religious and ethnic, all around. Mm -hmm. So there's a real problem and failure of governance there. But I think that this is something that for the, for the, for the, for the uh, Iranian government, mm -hmm has to deal with. I mean, it really does okay. not, it cannot uh, hide behind the central government narrative that everything is okay when in the peripheries, things are not. Uh, Ali, quickly, and then uh, uh, move well, on to the I, I just have to say that whenever I see uh, this type of terrorist incidents, mm. uh, I really must say that uh, they end up mobilizing the public yeah, behind course. the central government. Oh. Now, I happen to be very critical of the Islamic Republic, the regime which has misruled Iran for the past almost 40 years. Uh, and I'm deeply, deeply sorry to see that certain terrorist acts and expressions of secessionism or separatism actually end up mobilizing public support for the central government in Tehran. Mm. I genuinely believe that it is better not to change the political geography of Middle Eastern countries. And I genuinely do believe that it is better to achieve civil rights for the minorities within the existing borders that we have in the Middle East, rather than trying to start up new conflicts, okay. new terrible wars in the Middle East region. And, uh, and so we had another question from you, sir, uh, with the red hat, and then we're going to expand the conversation a little bit. Thanks. Um, identify yourself, please. Uh, my name is George from Mabri. I'm here Hi. on behalf of the... I think the only solution to the problem we, within Iran is uh, military force. And it has to also be done by the Arab Gulf states. Um, because Iran is the primary sponsor of terrorist, terrorism around the world. And pretty much every nation now at a point is suffering the consequences of that. They have terrorist groups hidden in many nations within the Arab world and so on. So is, it, wait, is your question, do we think that uh, the um, best solution for uh, repairing the relationship between Iran and, and the Gulf Arab countries is a, a war? No. Uh, I think we can answer that pretty quickly. I don't, I don't think the answer that's no. I mean, um, what I'm trying to say is that the clerics have all yeah. the power. I understand that. And they are trying to build this bomb. I don't think they have stopping. Gotcha. I think that the JCPOA needs to be completely ripped up is just allowing them more time to implement okay. their base for But this is so this is by way of being a comment and mm -hmm. thank you for your comment. And now I think we would like to look for a question. So I appreciate that. I'm just gonna intervene. Uh, and yeah, say, go right ahead. Th there and is then, no Arab army that could take right. out Iran. Yeah, we're not. Just like simple. Yeah. There is seriously no Arab army. I have serious doubts that even an American army could take down Iran. No, that, that's absolutely right. So uh, we've got Steve here and then you in the back. But, okay. Thank you. 
uh, Steve Sesh. I <clears throat> work here at the Arab Gulf States Institute. A uh, question for Ambassador Musevian, who I understood you earlier, sir, suggested Iran would be able to use its good offices in Yemen hmm. to broker a mediation, perhaps, between the Houthis and Saudi Arabia and the other combatants in the war. On the one hand, this would seem to me to reinforce the Saudi position, which is that the Houthis are simply proxies of Iran if you can, in fact, bring the Houthis to the table. So I'd like to ask you, is that true? And secondly, why would you have the confidence to believe that your government would at all be able to bring a fairly independent-minded Houthi movement into negotiations when they don't seem to be willing to do it on their own? Really interesting. Yeah, Steve, you know Houthis, they are not proxy group. Right. Everyone understand, if anyone uh, read the history of Yemen, they understand the Houthis, Zaydis, they have been ruling Yemen for 1,000 years. In 1962, when Egypt invaded Yemen to remove Zaydis Houthis, then Zaydis Houthis, they became the ally of Saudi Arabia for 40, 50 years. They were not ally of Iran. Abdullah Saleh was with Saddam, yeah. defending invasion of Iran. He was enemy of Iran. Therefore, they were for 1,000 years. But Zaydis are not, I mean, Zaydis yeah, and they are, are yeah, not synonymous. Yeah, but not 100%. But, but in general, right. Zaydis, Houthis, they are very, very much similar. And they, they both have been ally of Saudi Arabia for four That's true. decades. That's true. They came to Tehran when Saudis invaded Yemen. Practically, Saudis, they pushed Yemenis to Tehran. This was the Saudi mistake to attack Yemen. It was really based uh, on a very, very bad miscalculation. Mm. Because Saudis, they were thinking, Iran even publicly and confidentially uh, sent the message to Houthis before capturing San'a. They warned them not to capture San'a. It was Iranians who asked them, please not to do it. But they did it. However, it was, I mean, the, the whole Yemen issue is because of a miscalculation. Uh, Saudis, they thought they would capture, uh, they would resolve it in, in two weeks. Yeah. Why do you have the confidence, just given what you just yeah. said about the, the Houthis ignoring it's, Iran? It's a good Saudi, question. That Tehran can somehow coax the Houthis to the table? No, Steve, my, my response was this. Iran does not believe the reason of today's crisis in Yemen is because Iran is supporting Houthis. No, but... It but, is because of a war. Yeah. And all, mm, uh, I mean, disastrous consequences of a war based on a miscalculation. Yeah. However, Saudis, they blame everything on Iran and they say Houthis are proxy group of Iran. What we say, we say, if you really mean it, mm. then Iran is ready to help you to, uh, uh, to, to support Houthis, Saudis dialogue to bring a peace in Yemen. There, but there, what, I think what Steve's getting at, I'm going to take one more crack at this. What, what Steve is getting at is there's, there's a dissonance between saying on the one hand, we really don't have any much relationship with Houthis. They're, they're over there, we're over here, nothing. But we, can, we, can, we have to be a central player. We're an indispensable central player in bringing the Houthis to no, the table. No, it, is, it is, is another mistake. Really Believe work. me, saying this is a mis big mistake. Because when Europeans, I tell you a fact, when Europeans, they approached Iran to discuss Yemen, the Iranian supreme leader opposed. He said, we are nothing. Mm. And we are not representative of Yemenis. It has nothing to do with us. Right. We should not interfere. It is not our issue. But Yemenis, they came and they asked Tehran, if Europeans, they want to play mm. a positive role. I mean, Houthis, they said, we are ready to cooperate with Europeans to bring a dialogue, to bring, to bring peaceful settlement. Based on Houthis' request, Iranians, they talk to EU. Iran is never is intended to represent Houthis or to say, no, we have to be in the negotiation. Iran really prefers mm -hmm. to stay out of Yemen issue. Okay. All right, fair enough. Uh, next question comes right here and there. So we'll begin with the lady in the front here and then the gentleman in the back. Thanks for your answer. Hi, I'm Mimi Burke from Brownstein Hyatt, and I have a question for Ambassador. Um, you said that this 
animosity between the Iranians and the Saudis and Emiratis is a fairly new thing. Um, what, what do you think is behind this animosity? No, uh, uh, don't take me wrong. This anim animosity started from the day one of revolution when Saddam invaded and Saudis, Emiratis, and some other GCC members, they supported Saddam invasion of Iran, paid Saddam about $200 billion. But right after the war, Iran decided to go to rapprochement with GCC. And there was huge diplomatic efforts. And Iran-Saudi relation also was improved very much at very high levels after 1996. And Iran put on the table of GCC, the regional cooperation system to remove every concern they have about Iranian interference, hegemony, or so and so. Right after the war, Iran put aside the hostility with GCC and decided to go for rapprochement. Since then, Mm. All political fractions, they have been advocating cooperation with GCC. What I said, this has been revived during the war, it was the case. But after 1988 to 2016, 2017, when President Trump withdrew, the case was completely different. Every political fraction was calling for good relation with uh, GCC countries. Mm. Now after uh, Trump uh, withdrawal, again, we are uh, back to war situation. I mean, 1990, 1980 to 1988. Mm. The reason you asked is because a uh, huge amount of WikiLeaks documents mm now is revealed that even after 2005, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, they all have been pushing the US to attack Iran. You remember John Kerry just a month ago said, in every meeting we were going, Saudis, Emiratis, Egyptians, they were asking us to attack Iran. Now this is revealed. So why now, why second, so no, second, I mean, this, if, if you ask me why they invaded Iran at the first days of revolution, everything you are talking about today, regional situation, at the first month of revolution, we had nothing. Nothing, no Yemen, no Syria, nothing. Just they invaded to break down Iran because they think Iran is too big, too powerful. And I would say to be, to be, to be fair, I would say the GCC concern about uh, the, the role on the weight of Iran, the first concern is Iran. Whether you believe it or not, the second concern is after Iran is Saudi Arabia. Because they know Saudi Arabia also is after uh, uh, hegemonic uh, intention toward GCC. But you can see in Qatar. Even uh, your timeline, though, suggests there's something special. In, in the revolution because Iran existed in its same size with at least as much power before the revolution. So there's something about the revolution that changed things. Yeah, of course, right. okay. of course. So no, I said after we, revolution. As long as we Before revolution, as long as Iran so, had a yeah, strategic gotcha. relation with the US, there was no chance okay, for them. Right. No. Okay, so uh, let's bring in uh, our other panelists uh, to talk about the, the underlying tensions and uh, oh, I, I, I would like to thank the moderator for bringing in the uh, minor historical detail of the 1979 revolution, which of course you know, changed Iran's relations with neighboring countries. Because Ambassador Musavian, uh, in his chronology, did not mention the fact that uh, Grand Ayatollah Khomeini, from day one of the revolution, was calling for overthrow yeah. of the House of Saud, well, of which was the reason yeah. why Saudi Arabia chose to support the Iraqi war against Iran in the course of eight years. So in other words, the Islamic Republic of Iran and the generation of Ambassador Musavian, which is in power even today, is responsible for pursuing a policy of export of the revolution, which has brought disasters upon Iran in the Middle East region. That is the first part, uh, part of the history of, of the Islamic Republic. Now, the second issue, of course, is that yes, of course, there is great power rivalry between mm. Iran and Saudi Arabia, just like historically there has been great power rivalry between France and Britain or France and Germany. Uh, 
And of course, the very fact that there was a vacuum of power after US-led invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq in the Middle East, and both countries, Saudi Arabia and Iran, tried to fill the vacuum, Iran more successfully than Saudi Arabia, of course, there is a conflict, and this is why we are there. But we also need to try to understand if it is possible at all in, in the near future to bring the two countries to the negotiation mm. table and talk things through. The precondition for that, as I see it, from the Iranian side at the very least, is that Iran is speaking with one voice. Ambassador, Rouhani, uh, Ambassador Musavian uh, is the voice of reason. Perhaps after all the mistakes that his generation committed from 1980 to 1988, Wiser today, he is telling us that there is need for dialogue and negotiation. Oh. I am not entirely convinced that the other faction in Tehran, the faction led by the Islamic Revolution and the Guards Corps, has reached a similar conclusion okay. as Ambassador There's Musa. a lot of mistakes going around. Uh, I'm going to ask Basma to actually... Um, you know, land the plane for us oh, here great. because oh, we're great. running out of time. And uh, so if you I'm could just, pilot. yeah, I know. That's why That's why I'm handing it, the controls over to you. Thank Bring you. her in. Uh, I mean, the, the core, there is, there is religious rivalry. The narrative has been uh, each wanting to claim that they are the legitimate home of an Islamic state, uh, not the Islamic state that we know yeah. of today, but an Islamic run it's state. It's between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and I think the Saudis have always felt that, you know, they are the custodians of the two most important sites in Islam, yeah. that they are the legitimate voice of that, and that we should be one. As I've yeah. heard them say, officials have often said, we we want to represent the entire Muslim world and be one. Whereas I think the the the, the, the Iranians uh, rightly point out, yes, we, maybe it's one in the parlance of, of the Muslim community, community one ummah, but at the same time, there are two branches to that. Mm -hmm. There is the Sunni branch and there is a Shia branch, and both need to be respected. And to get uh, Iran to represent that or to feel as though they're being respected as a representative of the Shia community has been something that the Saudis cannot get, get cannot get through. You know, they just cannot conceive of this idea that there may be several branches of Islam. So I think there's there's an essence of that. Some may put into it, I think there is some, and you kind of went further back in time, civilizational challenges. You know, there's you know, the Persian Empire feels as though it has a very great history that is quite unique and special, very sophisticated and elegant, and that the Arabs are not nearly as much. We've heard from the, you know, the Arabs Arabs as well saying that, you know, the history shows that Arab civilization has brought some of these great wonders uh, through Islam to, to Iran. So there's, I think there's a lot of historical narratives at play, but I think this tug of power that we see, and I want to just really end up on this little one line, mm. the Americans have taken full advantage of. Okay. Look, today the Arab Gulf is the largest purchaser of arms in the world. And I'm sorry, but the, this town does not help but feed into that Iran is a threat, the civilizational Sunni Shia challenge is something that is, you know, I mean, reductionist Sunni Shia uh, sectarian analysis is commonplace in this town because it, it sells. It sells the weapons that make a lot of money in this town too. So, I mean, I, I want to just, you know, be very blunt about that. I think there is some onus mm -hmm. on some of us in this town too to think about, you know, our responsibility in, in making this even worse. Well, on that cheery note, I want to thank everybody for joining us this afternoon and uh, our distinguished panel joined me in thanking them. And um, thanks, thanks to everybody for uh, hanging in there and tuning in online. See you next time.